here at the 10th edition of the Lahore Literary Festival. Thank you to the LLF organizers for giving us this platform for this important conversation and many others like it. Um, my name is Asif Nawaz Shah. I'm an urban and climate policy analyst currently based in Dubai, but I'm originally from Lahore and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Uh, we have an esteemed panel of, of speakers with us who uh, cut across the fields of journalism, advocacy, um, and, and investigative reporting. Um, first, we have Ms. Beth Gardner, who's an American journalist based in London. Her work has appeared in publications including the New York Times, The Guardian, National Geographic, The Smithsonian, Time, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, and Yale Environment 360. These days, she focuses mainly on stories about environment, health, and sustainability, but she's written about everything from politics, education, and feminism to food and the arts. Her first book, Choked, is a landmark work on one of the world's most urgent health threats, the dirty air that claims more lives than AIDS, diabetes, and car accidents combined. Thank you, Beth, for joining us today. Um, our second panelist is Ms. Marian Wilkinson, who is regarded as one of the most distinguished journalists in Australia. A member of the Australian Media Hall of Fame, Marian was a pioneer in the resurgence of Australian investigative journalism. She was a senior journalist for many years with the Sydney Morning Herald and worked as its Washington correspondent, environment editor, and deputy editor. Her latest book is The Carbon Club, published in 2020, which chronicled the crippling effect of the fossil fuel lobby in Australia on the government's ability to enact effective and meaningful policy reform to address climate change. Thank you, Marion, for joining us today. And last but not least, we are joined virtually by Ms. Shazia Rafi from New York. Ms. Rafi is the president and convener of Air Quality Asia, which is an international air quality advocacy group. Um, working to secure a breathable future for Asia by advancing progress towards the SDGs most relevant to air quality. From 1996 to 2013, Ms. Rafi served as the Secretary General of Parliamentarians for Global Action, PGA, which is a non-profit, non-partisan organization of elected legislators from over 130 countries that leverage parliamentary processes to promote peace, international law, gender equality, and reproductive health. Air Quality Asia is currently working with programs across Pakistan, India, and Indonesia, promoting a successful parliamentary action model. Thank you all very much for agreeing to be a part of this session. I'm, very, I'm personally very excited about this topic and this talk because I think we often speak about the climate crisis and speak about sustainable development in a very narrow frame and through a very specific policy lens. And what this does is it can sometimes make this topic daunting or alienating and prevent pe the people who have the greatest stake in this issue and in this crisis from actually not just educating themselves about that crisis, but becoming a part of the solution to that crisis. So in one way or another, you know, the stats are out there, the information is out there, the message is clear, climate change is real. But somehow, where we are today in 2022, seven years on from the Paris Agreement, seven years on from the advent of the Sustainable Development Goals, we still have not managed to crack the message that we need to put out there to influence governments and civil societies alike to mobilize for concrete action on this issue. So that is what this panel today will be covering uh, with, our, with our esteemed guests. We'll be talking about how to humanize this crisis, this very real, very human crisis, which has impacts that we're seeing already all around the world from developed to the developing world. And with that, before we get into discussing some of the policy intricacies of the crisis and of the sustainable fr development frameworks that we're working with around the world, I want to start by asking our panelists what their own personal climate stories are, because I think we can all agree that storytelling is the way we all really relate to issues like climate change, and effective storytelling is really the key to pushing the needle on climate action around the world. So, Beth, I'll start with you. Um, what's your climate story? How did you end up working 
as an environmental journalist? How, what led you to the work that you've been doing most recently, uh, including Choked, which those of you who were here yesterday in this hall, in fact, might have heard more about. Um, so, um, oh, can everyone hear me? Am I close enough to the mic? Okay. Um, so I spent the first 10 years of my career in journalism very much as a general assignment reporter. I worked for the Associated Press news agency, first in New York and then in London. Uh, and at the AP, you kind of cover anything and everything, whatever is thrown at you that particular day. So I sometimes hit on environment stories, but you know, plenty of politics, culture, uh, whatever was in the headlines. Um, when I left the AP to become a freelancer, at the very end of 2006, so more than 15 years ago now, it gave me the freedom to chart my own course and, and choose my, my own topics and, and what I wrote about. And it, it seemed clear to me at that time and you know, vastly more so today that these stories around environment um, and particularly climate change and for me, air pollution, which has been my, my topic over the last six plus years, that, that collectively these stories are the, the most important story of our time. Climate change is the, is the, I think everyone understands now, is and is only growing more so the defining story of our age. Um, but I, I guess in, in the last five or six years, as I've said, I've covered this, this issue which sort of runs parallel to the climate crisis and, and intersects with it. Um, to a, a large extent, but is also very much its own story, and I think would be an overarchingly important story even if there were no climate crisis. Um, so I, I started writing about air pollution, I guess, back in 2014, 2015. I live in London. I'm from the U.S. I had lived in New York before coming to London, and I always noticed... Um, the air bothered me in London. There was this thickness when you walk down streets. I'd get like a little bit lightheaded, even just out on a kind of five minute walk on a busy road. And I had never experienced that in New York, even though it too has cars, traffic, buses, all of that. And I didn't understand why. No one around me seemed to be talking about it. There was this idea of London's pollution being in the past, you know, the great, the great smogs of the 1950s and we fixed that and, you know, it's not an issue anymore. Um, so I kind of pushed it out of my mind. Um, and then a after I started freelancing, I, I happened to be working on a story that required me to sit down for a couple of minutes and Google the science of air pollution and its impact on health. This is in the course of, of reporting something else. And literally, after about five minutes of, <laughs> of reading online, my jaw just dropped and yours well, you, you know the science because you've worked with Air Quality Asia, but you know it kind of blew me away, the, the extent to which air pollution impacts us. Um, you know, the, the World Health Organization, and this is now very much a conservative estimate at the low end of, of what other scientists have said, but the World Health Organization says seven million people every year have their lives cut short by breathing dirty air. In Pakistan, that number is more than 235,000 people annually. Um, and it's not just that, that it's giving us asthma and breathing problems, et cetera, things you might not be that surprised to know, but air pollution is also linked by a very, very extensive body of scientific evidence now to um, everything from heart attacks and strokes to cancer, dementia, premature birth, even now diabetes, obesity, mental health issues, or, or the, you know, the, the more the research moves forward, the more illnesses are being linked to air pollution. So this really shocked me. It upset me as an individual because London is more polluted than New York, unfortunately, orders of magnitude less polluted than, than Pakistan and South Asia, which is the sort of epicenter of the, of the global air crisis. But you know, to get back to your question of kind of my, my journey with covering this, um, I, I was upsetting as an individual and as a parent. By that point, I, I had a child, and we know children and, and older people are the most vulnerable to, to health impacts of air pollution. But also as a journalist, it really struck me as like, this is a big story. This is an important story and it's, it's totally undercovered. Why, why am I not reading this every day? You know, why is it not at the top of the news if something else was killing 40,000 Brits, 235 Pakistanis, 7 million people globally 
every year. That would be like all we would hear about in the news. So I kind of applied myself to, I took that on as my story and I started covering it. I started traveling around the world to report choked and, and I learned that this is really a universal um, problem. You know, there's almost no place in the world that, that where people really are breathing healthy air. Um, this is a, largely a result of the fact that we've built our, our modern world on fossil fuels and that's obviously where the, the air pollution and, and health side of things intersects with the, the climate and sort of future sustainability side of things. And, you know, I know we'll get to this more later, you, but you talked about sort of how do you, how do you make it relevant. The, the thing that is difficult, I think, about air pollution, and it's a, a political challenge when it comes to, you know, wanting to clean up the air, is that so, you know, everything I just told you is very, very strongly scientifically grounded, right? 235,000 Pakistanis dying every year from air pollution. But yet on an individual level, you know, if, if your um, loved one has a heart attack or, you know, your child has an, you, you, the doctor usually can't say this is because of air, you know, on an individual basis that you had your heart attack because of air pollution as opposed to something else. So as a journalist then, my challenge felt like not only to make this somewhat daunting issue kind of interesting and readable, but also to, to use storytelling as a way to help people see those links. You know, with air pollution, you hear a lot about this idea of invisibility. And it's not just that the pollution in the air that we're breathing oftentimes is invisible, but th those, can, those cause and effect connections you can't quite see with the naked eye. So I've tried to use writing and, and storytelling, and I've intervie interviewed people, you know, all around the world from, from Poland and London to Los Angeles and, and Beijing and New Delhi, and now, now meeting people this week here in um, Lahore to, to learn about what's been happening in Pakistan. So, you know, I've tried to use my, my journalistic um, skills to, to help illuminate this because I think it's a, a really important story that, it, that it's not adequately covered and therefore people don't adequately understand how much it's affecting them. And obviously that has a knock-on effect if you don't have the public awareness and concern and anger, because people are angry when they learn about this, rightly so, if you don't have that, then you don't have the political pressure for governments to actually do something about it. Absolutely. Um, and just FYI, Choked is an excellent read. So if you're interested in learning more about the air pollution crisis all around the world, um, I think particularly the chapter on Delhi will ring really, really true for a lot of people here if you've experienced the smog season, which is pretty much year-round now in Pakistan. So please do uh, give it a read. And we'll talk more about that and, and specific stories further along the session. Marion, um, I want to call on you and, and ask you about your own journey, um, especially around writing your latest work, The Carbon Club, and, and what that took to really get in under the skin of of that crisis in Australia and around the world? Well, funnily enough, um, because climate change, I think we all know, is a universal story. So my story actually started in Washington, D.C. And back in 2005, I'd been a correspondent there, and I'd come off reporting the Iraq war from the Washington end and a lot on terrorism, and I was completely burnt out. And uh, a friend of mine said, hey, why don't you help me do a documentary on climate change? And you could do some great work for us digging around in DC. And what we're interested in is the power of the fossil fuel industry. I thought, sure, I'll do this. So I started digging around. And uh, anyway, basically what I discovered was, of course, that Unsurprisingly, as I know, or a lot of you here know, the fossil fuel industry is a very powerful industry and works very closely with politicians and does stand over them and does then they both work together for their mutual benefit. Now, that project went bust, but I was so excited about what I'd found when I returned to Australia, I said to my editor, I want to go on the environment round. I want to do this story. And it might sound a bit melodramatic, but I went from covering wars to covering what is known in Australia by everyone as the climate wars. And 
what the climate wars were in Australia, and they went on for more than a decade, was political power plays in our parliament, in our government, by fossil fuel interests and their supporters to fashion our climate policy and defeat climate legislation. Those groups helped bring down three successive prime ministers in our country. And when I sat down to write this book, I sat across the table from the last prime minister who had been brought down. So to finish that part of the story, so I sat across the table from the last prime minister that had been just brought down. And the guy was still in complete shock. There was a, he had a lot of problems. He brought a lot of things on his own head. But what was interesting to me was that a group of pro-coal backbenchers had brought him down, threatening a no-confidence motion. This might have some resonance here in Pakistan. Uh, but um, what happened after that is I really wanted to dig into how these politics are played absolutely on the ground level. And so I did dig into this in my book and I did lay out, and I do lay out in this book, a lot of things that I think are universal about the way big power, big money interacts in Australia. Now you might say, why is the fossil fuel industry so powerful in Australia? Most people don't know this, but we are right up there with Russia and Saudi Arabia as one of the most important fossil fuel countries in the world. We are the biggest coal exporter in the world. We vie with Qatar to be the biggest LNG exporter in the world. We make a bucket load of money from fossil fuels. But like Pakistan, we are in the top 10 countries who are due to feel the worst impacts of climate change. So that's why this is such a huge fight in Australia and why careers rise and fall over climate change. But at this point, I'm gonna change the story because what happened while I was writing this story was that a new story emerged and that came from people, from mothers, fathers, from children, from grandmothers, and how that story suddenly became a huge story in the climate wars was that at the end of 2019, we had one of the worst droughts we'd ever seen in history. People were pushed off farms all over the country. That was followed by the worst bushfires in our history. And in the summer holidays of 2020, January 2020, hundreds of mums and dads and grandmothers took, as they often did, to the coast, to the little villages and towns up and down the coast of Australia to go on their holiday as the entire east coast started burning. And those fires and the winds behind them completely overtook the country. Something like 10 million hectares of the country burned. That's twice the size of Belgium. Millions of native animals were killed. People in their, in their holiday villages rushed to the coastline, stood sheltering on the beaches as the birds literally fell from the skies on their heads. Parrots, cockatoos, kookaburras, they were walking over a whole sea of birds to get to the sea to get evacuated. When the firefighters came into the little towns, the roads were strewn with dead kangaroos. This is an animal that has evolved to outrun bushfires. They could not outrun the speed and ferocity of these fires. On the actual weeks of the fires, the death toll was remarkably low. It was 33 thanks to good management, good evacuation and a lot of luck and a lot of bravery by volunteer firefighters. But over the next 12 months, over, well over 400 people died from the air pollution. 
because where I lived, where in the cities all the way up the coast, the pollution was far worse than you see in Lahore, in Delhi, in Beijing. It was choking. And a giant plume of smoke came up over Australia and the ash fell right over to the Alpine peaks in New Zealand. That was climate change in action. All the scientists had been saying, Australia, you are going to get more extreme bushfires. You are going to get more extreme floods. That's when the story began to change in Australia because that story was written and told to journalists by ordinary people, and I spoke to a lot of them. Indeed, my brother-in-law was one of the people fighting those fires on the front line. And now we're coming into another part of the story. And I, for me, this is the, probably the best part of the story I want to write, is that that suddenly broke the left-right divide in our country about climate change. Suddenly you had billionaire businessmen, conservative politicians, joining with investor activists, joining with school strike climate activists, saying, we want to change the story of Australia. We do not want to be a fossil fuel power in this century. We want to be a renewable energy superpower, and we can do it. And that is the story I want to write, because I want to leave you with one thought that is now motivating me in the stories I write. I've interviewed scores and scores of climate scientists while I've been doing my stories and this book. And the message they say to me that isn't communicated with the public is that we have this decade to turn this around. And that means that every one of us, me, the people on this stage, you out there, we are the last generation that can prevent dangerous climate change. If you think about that, that's a story we've got to tell. Thank you so much, Marian. Um, and we'll come back to that last story or the last chapter that you just touched upon um, later on in the conversation. I want to take this now to Shazia Rafi, who's joining us virtually. Oh. <laughs> Just a second while we uh, get Shazia back. Hello. Hello. Yes, we're back on, and uh, you have the floor, Shazia. So, uh, if we can just hear a little bit about your story, how you came to be working within this space, and what the kinds of stories you tell and the audience you tell them to, uh, what the power of those stories are.
Uh, I think they're just coming up now. Yes. They're just coming up now. So that's kind of my climate story and why I chose to use policy and legislation um, using the legislative branch of government um, to get to uh, this point where I am now uh, leading this particular uh, advocacy group. And I look forward Thank to the discussion Great. Thank you so much, Shazia. And I think uh, just stick Sticking on that point, um, when it comes to making the case to these decision makers and these, these policy makers, that is essentially also telling a story and telling these people the story that they want to hear that will induce them to take the kind of action we need to be taken. So what does a successful model of that kind of advocacy look like and how do you go about making that case, reconciling both the, the need to actually take concrete action with the need to get these people on board and build these strong coalitions of actors to, to get the work done. Okay. Um, you want me to go next? 
Yes, yes. So successful advocacy and pressure on climate change, air pollution, is a question of who needs to be communicated with and pressure forward policy change. And for successful advocacy, we first need to understand the challenge and what are the levers of change. So the challenge for South Asian governments is enormous as the Indo Asiatic plane is ground zero air pollution at the Pacific. This is a cumulative um, graph looking at um, uh, you know, picture, looking at 10 years of PM 2.5 adjusted for population. Today's snapshot which shows South Asia in the darkest red. Um, China and Northeast Asia are beginning to come out of um, their uh, you know, uh, worst pollution because of the climate policy. Of the world's cities with the highest air pollution, 40 out of are now in South Asia, four are in Pakistan. Lahore regularly trades most polluted status with the leader. I mean, you know, I mean, they, they go flipping back and forth in terms of who's <laughs> got that uh, championship country. As air pollution has no boundaries, they are also impacted by transboundary pollution from India, which is the region of the largest economy. Uh, South Korea, by the way, faces the same challenge from China's air pollution. The Chinese have moved all their coal plants from around Beijing to the northern part of their country, and now the air is headed in the direction of the Korean Peninsula. For air pollution, or what is sometimes referred to as smog in Pakistan, we need advocacy and pressure at three levels the federal government, which is responsible for climate change, provincial governments, which are responsible for environment protection, and the business sector. All three sectors need to understand that air pollution leads in addition to the majority of deaths from respiratory illness, asthma, COPD, but also 36% of deaths from lung cancer, 34% of deaths from stroke, 37% deaths from heart disease. So the figures you know that we are quoting from WHO are heavily understated, including the fact that they are based on a base year of 2016. There is now clear evidence that COVID-19 pandemic death rates are also worsening by over 15% because of air pollution. And there is also some research saying that the virus uses uh, air pollution particles for transmission. Across Asia, Air Quality Asia works with parliaments, which are the part of the government that has the power to enact laws, um, regulations, to oversee regulations, and agencies that are implementing them and to approve budgets. So that is uh, uh, the niche that I work with all my life, and that is what I am working with on this issue as well. Now, narratives presented to this audience have to be extremely concise, um, and data has to be presented in graphs. Um, this is partly because politicians are extremely busy. This is one of the many issues that they deal with, but also the visual uh, impact of graph as well as data which is concise and clear so that the path that needs to be taken is also very clear as an important thing. Um, they're not the ones who will read the footnotes. And, and uh, in most parliaments, only about one week, they do their hand and they start to do that. In 2019, Air Quality Asia asked the Children's Hospital Lahore, which is the largest children's hospital in the entire region, to present the findings to our session of the National Assembly. Covering a 10 year period, the doubling of pulmonary disease among children. Um, the children seen it because they are sick enough to go to the hospital. Uh, there was an eye opener for shopping was the presentation by an Islamabad lung care specialist, cancer specialist, who told MNAs that he was coming from giving a terminal diagnosis to a young, otherwise healthy student. I remember the silence in the room was very heavy for several minutes. According to the Global Alliance on Health Information, air pollution deaths have a bell curve. They rise as countries move from low income to lower middle and upper middle income and drop as they reach high income. Why is that? It's because our means of generating energy, of transportation and means of production remain polluted while higher income countries have had more access to technology solutions that are green and green. That differential can change as green energy, green production technologies, electric mobility become cheaper and more accessible. So is a return to the whole blue 
nobody, however, wants to feel a rise in graduates till they set up country to the same white pipeline which the local refineries uh, produced year over one year. So changing fuel is only part of the solution. The SDG's goal is to expand public transportation systems to reduce the number of private vehicles while providing increased mobility to citizens. China, for example, um, has met their targets set in 2013 and 2014 of reducing private vehicles from a projected 400 million to cap at 250 million, while building up alternative public transport, thousands of kilometers, rail transit, intercity, intercity, bus lines. Enrique Peñalosa, somebody that I admire a lot, former mayor of Bogota, always says a developed country is where the rich take public transport. I unfortunately live in such a city where the mayor is the winner is right somewhere along with the homeless. All our cities globally must also expand dedicated bike lanes and bring back safe footpaths to be walkable. Building more passes and flyways is the wrong way to go. On the energy generation side, Pakistan's um, renewable energy sector, not including hydro, is still a nascent sector, but we're building up with some support from the Green Climate Fund. Mm -hmm. On industry emissions, we do face a big problem. Human production technologies exist, but they are more costly, and the question of who will bear that cost is the main problem. Shaz to transition to a green economy, we must begin to count the economic cost of pollution, currently unaccounted for by our finance ministers and our GDP of businesses in their cost accounting. According to the World Bank, globally the cost of air pollution was 5.3 trillion in 2016. Pakistan's cost of air pollution was 5.8% of GDP. If we apply that to the 2019 GDP, over 15 billion is leaking out of our economy in air pollution costs. We do know that air quality improvement policies work and they generate economic benefits. According to the IMF, every dollar in renewable energy or sustainable energy use has a multiplier of into seven times larger than fossil fuel. The issue is how to make that economic benefit pass onto the consumer, worker, private investor, least consumer, along with the national treasury. Right. Um, I'll leave it there um, and uh, you know, um, we Thank you, Shazia. And I think um, on that point, I want to bring in Marion. Um, Sha like from what Shazia showed, once the evidence is there, once the stats are there, once the clear impact of climate change and the associate crisis we're facing is there and the case is made. Um, and going back to what she was speaking about, that last chapter where that cloud of ash was across the eastern coast of Australia and that cloud united members of the private sector with civil society, with government. Um, what comes next? What is the risks? What are the risks that, that that kind of coalition also entails? Because these are the same actors who have contributed to, some of these actors are the same ones who have contributed to this crisis. And particularly around the advent of you know, social media and digital technologies. How do those new tools and methods of, of communication and association help level that playing field? Yeah, well, I think that's a, a very interesting question that you raise because I think the thing is, we all know now uh, that the climate crisis is upon us. We all know, as we saw in the last IPCC report, People are dying now because of climate change. They're certainly, as Beth and Shazia well documented, they're dying from air pollution um, as, a, as a joined but separate issue. I think the mistake is to think that, at this point, the fossil fuel industry is gonna lie down and say, great, hands up, we're, we're guilty, we're gonna help you, we're gonna change this. Some will, some forward-thinking uh, executives will, people who do want to save their shareholders' money and their investors' money, but a lot will not. And they will argue about this. They will fight this. And 
I can tell you right now, they are using social media so effectively to fight this. We see this in Australia all the time. We've got an election coming up in six weeks. There's one absolutely critical seat that the government needs to take from the Labor opposition. That happens to be in one of the biggest coal mining districts in the country. That one electorate is being swamped both with advertising uh, on everything you can see, billboards, on trams, on uh, public transport, but it's also being deluged with social media campaigns. It comes back to this, essentially. Uh, the world is going to change if we don't, uh, if we in Australia want to stick with our present position. I have no doubt that China, for all its faults, faults and, self, um, and false starts on this, is now determined to win the technical, technological revolution on energy with the United States. China sees its future as winning the clean energy revolution against the United States. If Australia doesn't get on board with this, all our fantastic export wealth to China and Japan, to South Korea and uh, other countries that compete with China, that will disappear. And I think what we need to do is to write these stories, write the practical reality of these stories about how people are being impacted, but most importantly, write about what is going on with the solutions. What do they cost? And what's the cost of inaction? And I think then, speaking, uh, trying to get through the disinformation, get that story out, uh, will have a, will actually have a big impact because we have to remember people are really scared by this change. People will lose their jobs. You can't lie to them about the fact that you will lose your job in a coal mine. You will lose your job in a coal-fired power station. But I think getting that truth out and actually having a conversation with people where you take them seriously uh, about what their needs are and what they need to have provided, then I think those stories will actually cut through to people. Absolutely, and I think we hear a lot about how sometimes climate change is seen as something that's kind of far away from people's everyday reality. Um, and it's, it's something that's you know, more important as uh, counterintuitive that, as that is in a place like Pakistan, that's more important to Western countries and that the Western countries have the onus of changing that. And while that's true, um, at the end of the day, you need to be able to meet people where they are. And I think that failure of communication, Beth, is something I want to talk to you about. Um, your book, sources, stories, but also like Marianne said, solutions, stories about solutions and what people are doing on the ground yeah. to fight a crisis like this, a crisis that isn't just about the environment, but about health as well. Yes. And I think the same holds true for climate change. So how, how does that kind of localized you know, solution development and, and telling stories about local solutions push the needle and, and how can we do more of that? I think those stories are so important and so powerful and these issues can feel so overwhelming and you know there's this struggle between sort of pessimism and, and optimism and realism and I, I don't know I find when I write articles or when I was writing my book you know I was constantly being pushed by my editors to say you know what can you give us some hope get, put some hope into the story and as a journalist you know I in a way don't see that as my role I my the job of a journalist is to tell the truth right and to find the facts on the ground and, and report them as we see them and people can sort of do what they what they will with that um, but at the same time you know we we do need hope and I think that wh where I found that was exactly as you say in the stories of, of activists um, and these people I met, you know, air pollution activists all around the world, but uh, the same holds true for, for climate activists, and very often they're the same people. Um, you know, these activists who are just, you know, sort of relentless and, and tireless to the point of, 
sometimes and beyond the point of, of obsessiveness, you know, and and passion around this this issue. Sometimes it's motivated by a, a, a personal experience, and it often requires, um, you know, a real um, mastery not only of sort of go of going out into the streets, but of of you know how a legislative system works, how a legal system works. Um, in the front row here is uh, Lahore's preeminent uh, air pollution lawyer, who who knows that you know you win some and you lose some, right? These activists are fighting one battle after another, and a lot of times they don't win. But when you do win one, it it really matters. Um, you know, one of the chapters in my book is from Poland, uh, which is one of the most coal dependent countries in the world. Um, they they burn coal not only in their um, power plants for electricity, but also in their homes for heat through the winter with almost no filtration on the chimneys, and it just contributes to this you know, absolute choking smog that is, is far from unique to Poland, but it was a good place to tell that story. And in, in Krakow, which was at the time one of the most polluted cities, actually, they were um, a group that I originally came to through their social media activism. There was a group of parents who were fighting for a ban in their city on burning of coal and wood, which is actually, parenthetically, also extremely polluting, even though it sort of feels like a, quotes, natural fuel. Um, in, in home fireplaces and furnaces. And um, this, this group of parents was, you know, they were very savvy. They, they, they got billboards put up and on the, sort of a bu posters on bus stops. They had a march where parents came out and pushed empty strollers and prams through the streets to symbolize all the children who were stuck at home, um, not able to go out and play. This will be a familiar story to parents here in Lahore. And um, the regional legislature finally passed a ban on coal burning at home. It was struck down by a court. It passed again. They fought in the national, you know, on and on and on for years. And they, they finally won. And a couple of years ago, this ban came into effect. So within the city limits of Krakow now, you, you may not burn coal or wood in your home for heat. Yeah. Still burning it in the, you know, it's a very partial victory. It's imperfect. The city is ringed by suburbs and villages <laughs> where people are still burning coal, so obviously the, the, the pollution knows no borders. Um, but nonetheless, that is a powerful story in a country that, you know, at least until quite recently, has been absolutely all in with coal, the dirtiest fossil fuel there is. You know, the government is deeply intertwined with, with the coal industry of revolving door going both ways. So, you know, I, I think those stories are are very, um, they're powerful from, from a narrative perspective as a writer. That's a powerful story of, of people who suffered and, and won something that's not perfect and not complete, but nonetheless is very meaningful. Absolutely, and I think, so just one last quick round before we move on to the Q&A section, but I think something that's come out in all three of our panelists' uh, talks is this idea that the fight never really stops. And I think that's something, if you were at a session earlier today in Hall 1, that was, that was also the message. The struggle is ongoing. The struggle is never won. And so once you have these commitments in place, you know, we are, we're seven years on from the Paris Agreement and from the SDGs being, you know, uh, promulgated at the, at the UN, from the, the world signing on to this agenda. Um, in Pakistan, we have some commitments from the government around electric vehicles, around renewable energy transitions. In Australia, you have some commitments that are you know, to, uh, guided towards transitioning towards a cleaner energy economy. But the work of, of people is still not done because you actually haven't been able to see the effects of those policies yet. So, Marianne, um, if I go over to you, what do we need to, everyone in this room, everyone on social media, everyone who quite frankly, has a stake in the climate crisis being addressed. What do we need to do to make sure that those policies don't just stay on paper? Well, I know this might sound uh, probably naive to a lot of people, but I do actually think that if you live in any sort of a democracy, even a flawed democracy, there's a number one thing is that the politicians do need to hear your voice. I think that mm -hmm. is, people underestimate that. 
Um, but they do need to hear that voice because what all of you have to remember, and I think we, we kind of all know it instinctively anyway, but what I document in my book is the other uh, powerful people, particularly the people who don't want to uh, clean up their the petrol because it'll cost uh, them money or the people who want to keep uh, producing fossil fuels indefinitely, man, they are in the ears of the politicians yes. <laughs> every day of the week. Uh, and I know when I was doing my research, I uh, s spoke at length to ministers who'd sat in the climate and energy portfolios. And I naively used to think as a journalist, you know, maybe these um, big executives would come in and, you know, put up their graphs and uh, tell the story about why this should be done because of this amount of jobs. And what surprised me was that even in Australia, the minister would say, no, the guy from Glencore came in with a whole lot of the other foreign coal companies and he sat me down and said, if you put you through this legislation, we are going to kill you in this seat, we're going to kill you in that seat, and we're going to kill you in that seat. He said, it is as blunt as that. And that's what people outside don't see. So when I say that the politicians need to hear another voice, they do. But I think the other thing, and what gives me a lot of hope, is that there are a lot of people in business, in small businesses and large businesses, who really do get this now. And they would like people to tell their stories about why they want change. Because, you know, there is a lot of money sloshing around this world at the moment. A lot of places um, that need to, that need investment that can actually get investment. There are huge pension funds looking for things to invest. Countries like Pakistan do deserve uh, climate justice. They do deserve to get a flow of money out of the UN process. And that money can be invested here. And I think that is a story that Pakistan people can tell their government representatives. This is not a thing where it has to be a negative for the Pakistan economy. It can be a great thing for the Pakistan economy. And one thing that I am, have found fascinating writing my stories recently and talking at events with big business and investor groups is that a lot of people want to do this. They actually find it exciting they find it as an exciting opportunity. And I think that is a message that needs to get out there. Amazing, yes, completely 100% agreed with you on that. And Shazia, just to bring you in for a two minute roundup, um, as an advocacy group that is sort of liaising with the government, but also has its sort of presence in the international arena, right? So in the, in the UN sphere, what, where is your work going to take you? And where do you see the work of organizations like Air Quality Asia and other you know, climate change advocacy organizations in pushing the needle in, in unlocking those funds? I think we lost, uh, okay, while we wait to get back on, I think we can uh, move to the audience and get some questions um, before we wrap up. So, Yes, the gentleman in the, in the yellow shirt. Uh, thank you for both of you came from Pakistan. My question from Marion. You said that uh, this generation is the last generation to uh, save, to rescue the uh, planet Earth. Uh, my question is that uh, this generation uh, cannot do uh, how can this save this planet? Because now the climate change has uh, become a political um, uh, problem rather than an environmental. Uh, because now the destiny of this uh, generation are so in the hands of the politicians, especially of the big powers. So if they are not ready to solve out this issue, how can a common alignment solve out this issue? Marianne? 
Uh, for the rest of the audience who may not have heard that whole question, uh, tell me if I'm right about this. I think uh, you're saying, uh, um, I mentioned the fact that this is our generation's issue, but you're saying, how can we do this if the big powers won't play their part in doing this because we've seen these negotiations globally go on and on? I, I think that it, it's important those negotiations keep going because I think that's the only way you're going to get a financial distribution on any sort of climate justice money. But I think that we have actually moved on and while countries like uh, Russia and even a whole section of the US are resisting this, I do believe there is an issue that uh, countries like China are now getting it. Whatever, you, uh, whatever the criticisms of President Xi, I think they are getting it. And you know why I think that? Is because in the last round of climate negotiations, Japan jumped. It jumped up its targets. South Korea jumped up their targets. They didn't do that because of the United States. They did that because of China. And uh, Beth and I were actually talking about this the other day, uh, yesterday, when we were talking about air pollution. One of the fascinating things I saw I um, interviewing people about China was the way they dealt with this issue of, you know, these small bikes you have around Lahore? <laughs> Me and my husband have been, you know, dodging them as we went to the walled city. Uh, one of the things the Chinese did with several of their companies was that the, one of the first areas they took on in transport was the small bikes. But they did it very cleverly by doing fleets, you know, like the guys who deliver the food, the guys who deliver the laundry, all this sort of stuff, right? The company that developed that worked out a way where they could it was so successful because they could charge their batteries at home. Then they could say to those people, not only can you have a clean bike, but you can charge it at home and it's cheaper than buying fuel. One of the men who was involved in that company since then developed a car company, electric car company, which way undercut Tesla because he didn't want to compete at the top end of the market. He wants to compete with people who want to make small journeys around a city. So that's what I mean about the kind of innovation we're seeing and this persuading of people, not only is this going to be better for you, it's going to be cheaper for you and more convenient for you. And okay, let countries like America keep making uh, petrol cars and see what happens. And you know what? They're not. GM has flipped on petrol cars. Ford has flipped on petrol cars. So though these kind of innovations, they do change things. And so, sir, I take your point entirely, but I think, in a sense, this is getting out of the grip of the politicians, the world leaders of whether it's the US or Russia or whatever. Beth, did you have anything to, to add in response, or? Um, no, I, I thought that was a brilliant answer. I think we should take that. Okay, great. I just want to bring in Shazia, because Shazia is back with us. Shazia, I think the last conversation touched upon the other side of things, right? There's advocating and lobbying your government, but then there's also the international system within which we're all spectators. And how do you make that international system, as a country like Pakistan, how do we make that international system work for us and help unlock the opportunities that we need to unlock? Uh, can we go to another question in the audience? And yes, please. Yeah, one question and then we're finished. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. It was a nice talk. Uh, I would like to uh, refer to one particular... Yeah, uh, Shazia, we're actually uh, running out of time, so we're just taking one last question. Thing that 
Shazia, we're losing you. I think uh, the, the connection is really, really patchy. Um, so I don't think we can, uh, we can't really hear you. So, yeah. Can we? Uh, yes, please finish your question yes, and we'll please. wrap up. Uh, I was referring to this particular aspect that once uh, global promises are carried out in a climate summit regarding achieving a sustainable development goals. So my question particularly is that to what extent you see in the light of your conversation that how governments are serious about developing international law and legislating, for example, uh, a kind of solid policies for the masses. Solar, did you say solar policies for the masses? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think that it really varies and that, that, you know, as Marion was saying, we've seen some governments that are, are sort of going all in and taking this really seriously and seeing the opportunities there. Um, other governments are not. Um, but, you know, as Marion was saying, there's change on the grassroots, and I think one of the, the biggest um, and most impactful changes that we've seen in recent years has been the plummeting price of solar powers and solar energy. Um, you know, coal used to be seen as a sort of dirty, toxic, but cheap form of energy, and you would hear people say, you know, that's what we can afford, um, coal power and, uh, you know, carbon and and uh, particulate pollution be damned. Um, but it's really not true anymore. I know that Pakistan is still um, moving forward with building coal power plants, but in fact, solar now is, is much, much cheaper. So in a sense, it's n no longer a technological challenge. It's no longer even an economic challenge, but it's a, cha a political challenge that's about overcoming um, the, these, um, you know, very, very powerful and very entrenched fossil fuel interests that Marion has been talking about so eloquently, who, um, you know, are, are deeply influential and in not only the national level, but also the state and local level in many places, and are, are standing as a real um, barrier to the kind of change that we need and the kind of savings actually in terms of money and in, in terms of health that we could get by moving off of fossil fuels and onto cleaner energy. And actually, you know, you even get greater reliability. One of the big fossil fuel talking points that we hear endlessly is, you know, oh, the wind isn't always blowing, it's not always sunny, therefore renewables are, are not reliable. Well, I don't think we're, we're getting solar energy here at the Alhambra Center today, but we had two, or was it three, power cuts in the course of this one hour event. I, I um, hate to point out that when the power cuts happen, the diesel generator kicks in, and that's what's keeping us going. Um, you know, so fossil fuels have their own um, massive uh, reliability problems. They have all kinds of, um, you know, geopolitical implications, as, uh, you know, everyone across Europe now understands in a, on a painful gut level that they had preferred to ignore mm -hmm. before the uh, before Putin's invasion of Ukraine, you know, uh, the, the dependence on gas. So, so not getting off fossil fuels has, um, you know, obviously massive climate implications for the future of humanity, but if you needed anything more, um, you know, there's also the, the huge health implications, the reliability, and the, and the political implications of, of feeding endless money to petrostates. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the question. Thank you. I think that's all we have time for today. We've run over our allotted time. So thank you very much to Marion, to Beth, uh, to Shazia, and to everyone in the audience. You've been great. Thank you so much. Thanks and to can USF I, for great questions and yeah, terrific could I moderation. Thank <laughs> yeah. Asif, and can I thank the Lahore Literary Festival? This has been a brilliant festival, and I just take my hat off to everyone involved. Yeah, absolutely.